from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Ann McLean from the Music Division of the Library. And it's a great pleasure for us to present Dr. Aniruth Patel, whose lecture is the fourth presentation of our Music in the Brain series, which has been very generously funded by the Dana Foundation. Um, it's a partnership of the Music Division and the Science, Technology, and Business Division. If you're enjoying the series, and we have had great turnouts and a lot of calls about it, I'd like to invite you to leave your email on a piece of paper out in the area, the foyer, because we're going to be sending notices about our forthcoming podcasts and webcasts. Dr. Patel is Senior Fellow in Theoretical Neurobiology and the Esther J. Burnham Senior Fellow at the Neurosciences Institute in San Diego. His book, The Music of Language and the Language of Music, has just won the prestigious Deems Taylor Award. One of his primary areas of interest is the comparative study of how these uniquely human abilities can shed light on their underlying cognitive and neural mechanisms. Tonight, he'll be talking about some of the hidden connections between language and instrumental music, and I should say he is also a musician. Please welcome Dr. Patel. Thank you, thank you. Can you all hear me? All the way in the back, yeah? Good, okay, thank you, Anne, for, uh, for inviting me to this wonderful series. And um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm, this is my topic, the, the relationship between music and language. And let me begin, since we're just a few days post-election, uh, when President-elect Obama accepted uh, the presidency he asked us to think about what we all share as Americans despite our many differences. So let me take that question to the species level and ask us to think about what do we all share as humans despite our many cultural differences around the world? What are the abilities that define us as a species? Well, let's take a little trip to the Brazilian Amazon and visit a tribe that's been getting a lot of attention recently from anthropologists and linguistic anthropologists in particular, the Piraha. This is a small tribe in a remote part of the Amazon. And they're sort of remarkable in a number of ways. Uh, they don't have a lot of the things that we normally think of as coming along with human society. They're not that much into stuff. You can see there's a guy standing there with his possessions, a spear in front of a small hut. Um, they're not that into numbers, unlike us. We're all watching the stock market tremulously, but their language doesn't even have concepts for numbers, and they don't really have a concept of counting. Uh, they don't do much in the way of visual art. Uh, they don't have fixed terms for colors. They, um, they don't have any creation myths about where they came from. But they have language, like every human culture, and they have music, and they have lots and lots of music in the form of songs. Every human culture that we know of has music and language. These are universals, genuine human universals, and they go way back in our species history. So the question of what these two things might have in common has occurred to a lot of people, and it's sort of intuitive. They both involve complex sequences that unfold in time. They're both forms of communication. It's interested philosophers since Plato, going back over 2,000 years. Scientists, including Darwin, who wrote about possible evolutionary links between music and language in his book, The Descent of Man. And artists, including Leonard Bernstein, who gave a set of lectures at Harvard in the 70s about possible connections between the grammar of music and the grammar of language, according to Noam Chomsky's theories. So it's a persistent question, and I think it, uh, it continues to draw interest from scientists today because there are just some basic, obvious similarities. For example, both music and language have rhythm, by which I mean systematic patterns of timing, accent, and grouping. They both have melody, meaning structured patterns of pitch over time, and they both have syntax, I mean, discrete elements like notes or words, and principles for combining those elements into sequences. Sentences aren't just random sequences of words, and musical melodies and compositions are far from random sequences of notes. They're principles. And they both convey emotion or affect using sound. You can tell somebody's emotions from the sound of their voice, and you can get a lot of emotional information about music. Is it conveying happiness or sadness or, or mixed emotions or what have you? But the devil is in the details. How similar are they really when you put them under a microscope and look at them a little more closely. For example, 
one very characteristic feature of rhythm in the world's music is some sort of pulse, some sort of regular beat. And people often move their body to that. It's a basis for dance. Language doesn't really have that. Melodies around the world use pitch, stable pitch intervals. They have melodies drawn musical scales. Now, those scales themselves may differ from culture to culture, but the idea of using a set of pitches and moving between them is seen in just about every musical culture, and no language has that. In the terms of grammar and syntax, every human language uses that to convey propositional semantics, to refer to things in the world and make propositions about them, to say who did what to whom and why. And instrumental music can't do that, and that's my focus tonight, is, is instrumental music. And finally, on the domain of affect, OK, well, you can get some emotional information out of a voice and out of a piece of music, but are those really comparable? Are the emotions we feel when we experience music really anything like the everyday emotions of doing business in life? Are they just happiness and sadness and fear? Or are they much more complex, musical-specific emotions? So there's this tension between similarity and difference. And that is part of what drives this continuing dialogue among many people in many different fields about whether these things have anything in common. So what's new? Well, what's new is empirical work. As part of the, the explosion of research on music in the brain, in the last 10 years, there has been uh, a growing body of empirical work addressing questions between music and language, taking the tools of science to these questions and finding some interesting connections. And I'm going to talk about two tonight that I've called hidden connections, because they're just not that obvious at first glance, and maybe we never would have even found them if we hadn't applied some empirical methods. And uh, the ones I'm going to be focusing on are rhythm and syntax, and how language and music are related in those two ways. So let's start with rhythm. Now, how can we get some uh, purchase on the question of whether rhythm and language and rhythm and music really have anything in common? Well, one way in is to consider some pretty provocative claims that have been floating around in the musicological literature for a while about instrumental music reflecting a composer's native language. Let me give you a quote. This comes from a book by a musicologist, Gerald Abraham. Uh, he's quoting Ralph Kirkpatrick, who's a harpsichordist and music scholar, who writes, both Couperin and Rameau, like Faure and Debussy, are thoroughly conditioned by the nuances and inflections of spoken French. On no Western music has the influence of language been stronger. It's basically saying that something about Debussy's music sounds like the French language. It's, it's purely instrumental music. And other people have made similar claims about the music of English composers. And this sort of, people have intuitions about this. So let me play you a couple of quotes, uh, quote, uh, clips, and we'll do a little test. I'm going to play you a clip here, and uh, I'm going to ask you at the end of the clip if you think it was a, an English or a French composer. Now, some of you may know this piece, so that is cheating. But uh, <laughs> if you don't, tell me what you think. Okay. Okay, that's clip one. Now let's do clip two. Sorry. Okay, bring it down. Can you play that one again so we can do that one without the. Oh, that's uh, me. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, how many people think that second one was the French one? Okay, how many people think that was the British one? Good, good for you. Stand up for your rights. That's actually the French one, though. So the, uh, <laughs> uh, and the first one was the British one. In fact, those were clips from um, Debussy and from Sir El Edward Elgar, uh, two composers who have been particularly named in these sorts of speculations. So here we have some very provocative claims because there was no, no evidence uh, presented with these claims, just intuitions. Um, but we decided, hey, this is a neat way in. Let's try and see if we can go after this scientifically. So we started with the music of Elgar and Debussy and their contemporaries. And we took a scientific approach to this. We decided to examine languages that differed in their speech rhythm, find a way to measure that difference, and apply exactly that same measure to instrumental music with the hypothesis that the music would differ in a way that reflected the language. And for practical reasons, we started with English and French, because as I mentioned, those are the locus of these intuitions, um, some of them. And they have very different speech rhythms, according to linguists. Well, what does that mean? What, 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 what are linguists talking about when they say French and English have different speech rhythms? Well, there's an old theory about this. And the theory has to do, in English, with the way stress 
is pattern, okay? So when you speak in sentence of English, like the teacher is interested in buying some books, there's some syllables that are stressed. They're just more prominent than other syllables, even if you're not emphasizing a particular word. So if you mark those with X's, it's the teach of teacher, the int of interested, the buy of buying, and, and books. And linguists no notice that many times, if you say sentences like this, and you sort of observe the time intervals between the stresses, which you can do, say, by tapping, so uh, the, the teacher is interested in buying some books, those taps are almost like a metronome. You know, I wasn't speaking poetically, and yet those taps were coming out at very equal spaces in time. Um, and so they, th there's a theory built on this. that The, the, the rhythm of English is, is basically the metronomic timing of stresses. They kind of ch chunked out in a clock-like metronomic fashion. French, in contrast, was argued to have a different rhythm. There, the theory was also metronomic, but it wasn't stresses. It was just syllables, syllable onsets. So for example, in this sentence of French, Oops. Is that? No, it's not playing at all. Hmm. Oh, it's very slow? Okay. Le magasin est ouvert sans interruption toute la journée. Sorry. Can, did you hear it? Or is one more time? One more time. Le magasin est ouvert sans interruption toute la journée. Okay. It's soft. But she's saying, le magasin est, est ouvert. I won't say it. My French accent is so awful. <laughs> um, but anyway, the point is that if you take these bars as schematics for syllable onsets, it's these onsets that are getting chunked out at, at even points in time. So, th and, and this theory was kind of a grand theory. It, was, it thought all languages either had to fall into one of these two categories, either stresses or syllables were being chunked out kind of clock-like fashion. And it thought it grouped languages together that like English, German, and Arabic, and many others into the stress time category, and French, Italian, Yoruba, which is an African language, and many others into the syllable time category. So it kind of put languages together that were actually historically very distantly related, but they thought they belonged in these two, one of two rhythmic categories. And Japanese got into another category. Well, um, it hasn't been a very successful theory. All attempts to measure these uh, uh, things in speech have not supported it. So what's happened recently is that there's been a shift from this idea of speech as a metronome. I mean, you, you, know, you can find individual sentences that seem to work, but uh, it doesn't hold up as a generalization. And what's happened now is looking at patterns uh, that are rhythmic but not clock-like, okay? So what is an example of a, I mean, a clock is a prototypical example of a rhythm. It's something regular in time. But there are rhythms in the world that are structured, but they're not clock-like. So where I come from in San Diego, uh, a lot of people study the rhythm of the waves, applied, applied marine biology. They're called surfers, right? <laughs> and so they care about the rhythm of waves a lot. So let's say you're at a beach with your surfer guru, and he's telling you, look, dude, if you want to understand this beach, you gotta ignore the medium-sized waves. If you see a little wave, that's when you start swimming out. Well, why would I swim out for a little wave? Because, he says, after little waves come the big waves. So there's structure there, right? There's some predictability, but it's not temporal regularity. If you timed the onset, if you timed the, the times at which the waves were hitting the beach, it would not be a clock. They'd kind of be irregular, like waves are. But there's structure, little ones kind of predict big ones. So there's temporal structure without regularity, and that's kind of been a key conceptual shift in the way people study speech rhythm. And that plays directly into these comparisons that I'll be talking about. So what people are doing now is looking for linguistic phenomena that have rhythmic consequences in terms of these temporal patterns. And one of them is called vowel reduction. Now, what is vowel reduction? Vowel reduction, as I mentioned, in English, there are stressed syllables and there are unstressed syllables. But not all unstressed syllables are created equal. Some have what are called reduced vowels. That is, a, vowels that just get shortened and turned into kind of this neutral uh like sound. So take the word misery, okay? Misery has three syllables, and the stress is on the first syllable, misery. But those two second syllables are not equally, they're both unstressed, but the second one, the z, has a reduced vowel. It's just a uh, short little uh, misery. And so you can sort of think of it in a chart, the vowels coming in two flavors, stressed and unstressed, and the unstressed ones coming in two flavors, full and reduced. And well, what is all the significance of this linguistic kind of mumbo jumbo? Well, Reduced vowels tend to get very short in sentences, as I mentioned, sometimes a twentieth of a second, whereas stressed vowels, the ones that are emphasized, tend to be very long. So there's this kind of push-pull factor in the English language and other so-called stress time languages, as it turns out, between short vowels and long vowels. And this was an insight of Rebecca Dower, a linguist, who said, hey, all these languages we've been calling stress timed actually have very severe vowel reduction. Some of these vowels get very short, others get very long in the stressed syllables, and the so-called syllable time languages don't have that as much. Well, so what? I mean, how does that play into rhythm? It plays into rhythm because if you think about it, 
if you have a sentence where some vowels are very short and some vowels are very long, you're going to get a lot of contrast in duration between successive vowels in a sequence. Let me give you an example. So what I'm going to plot now is a graph, and it's a graph of the durations of the vowels in this sentence of British English. So I'm going to play a sentence here. Finding a job is difficult in the present economic climate. One more time. Finding a job is difficult in the present economic climate. Can you hear all that? You hear that? Okay. So um, this is the, the vowel duration of the first vowel, the second vowel, the third vowel. So, so finding a job is difficult in the present economic climate. And this is a sentence of French with its vowel durations. La reconstruction de la ville a commencé après la mort du roi. One more time. La reconstruction de la ville a commencé après la mort du roi. Okay, now let's look at these graphs. One thing that just jumps out at you is in the English sentence, there's a quite a bit of contrast between the durations of vowels. It's a zigzag pattern, right? A little short thing followed by a long thing followed by a short thing, for example, here. Now, the French has some of that there, but not nearly as much kind of on average, right? So if you could find some way to quantify this amount of what you might call swing, uh, the contrast between short and long, you might find that this English sentence has more of it than the French sentence. And that's exactly what some linguists have done, and they've cleverly invented a mathematical measure of this uh, duration contrast in sequences, which I'll introduce briefly here. It's, it's got a technical name, uh, the Normalized Pairwise Variability Index, but we'll just use the nickname, the NPVI. And the intuition of it is neat. If, you, if this is a sequence of durations, let's say long, short, long, short, um, if you have put a sequence of durations into this equation, it generates a high PVI because there's a lot of contrast between neighbors, right? So you've got a long next to a short, a long next to a short, a short next to a long, okay? Take that same set of durations and reorganize it. So now all the longs are next to each other and all the shorts are next to each other. Now this equation gives you a very low PVI because most of the time, the neighbors are kind of similar to each other in duration. So it's, it, what it cares about is each successive pair of durations. Are, are these two similar? Are these two similar? And how different are they? And it assigns a number. Now, if you do that, not just with one sentence of English and one sentence of French, but with a, you know, a decent-sized corpus, so you get a bunch of speakers to speak you know, a bunch of English sentences and a bunch of native French speakers to speak a bunch of native French sentences, and you, you measure these durations and uh, compute the score for each sentence, you find that English speech does really have a higher degree of contrastiveness between adjacent vowels than does French speech. You, one other way of thinking about it is that English speech sort of swings more than French speech, okay? And this has uh, now been found uh, in four published studies, so it seems to be robust. It's not just one study. Uh, one has even used spontaneous speech, so it's not just restricted to kind of red speech, which is important to know. But you might ask, well, what about dialect differences? We all know that languages differ within a country, and for example, here's a dialect map of Britain. And those of you who remember uh, My Fair Lady and Henry Higgins, who could place a person you know, within a couple of miles of where he or she was born, according to how they spoke, realize that, yes, there are these important differences within a language, so within English. So people have looked at the dialects of English and found that there is variation in this rhythmic measure, but it's small compared to the variation between English and French. So it does seem to be a real language difference, not just a kind of a dialect thing. So what we realized was we could take this wonderful work that's been done by linguists and apply it directly to music. How do you do that? Well, music notation is an un unambiguous indicator of the relative durations of events, and that's what the PVI cares about. It cares about the relative durations of neighboring events. So if you take a theme from Debussy, like this theme, and you can assign each note a relative duration. You know, say, quarter notes are one, then you know eighth notes are, should be a half, and so on, or triplets, each part of a triplet is a third. So you can assign it a sequence of numbers, same with this theme from Elgar, and you can compute this score, this NPVI for each theme. And it just turns out in this particular Debussy theme, it's 42.2 for Debussy and Elgar at 57.1, so it's higher. And if you read music notation, you might see why. The Elgar has a lot of these dotted rhythms, this sort of long, short, long, short. So I'll just play um, these for you. This is the, this is the Debussy. This is the Elgar. So in the Elgar, could you hear a lot of that bum bum, bum bum, bum bum? It's short long, short long, or long short, and that's what's driving up the value. Okay, so what we realized we had to do, of course, is not just look at one theme by Elgar and one theme by Debussy, but do you know some sampling here. So 
um, we decided to look at these turn of the century composers, because those are the ones where people had written about this intuition, and we looked at ones that were born in the 1800s and died in the 1900s, and we used this wonderful resource called a dictionary of musical themes. It's sort of meant to be like a Bartlett's quotations for music. You can just open it up and look at these themes that composers have written. So uh, we have six English composers and 10 French composers, so Elgar, Abdelius, Bax, Holst, and others, Debussy, and then Iber, Mio, Poulenc, Rebel, and so on. And we had about 300 themes total. It was very painstaking work hand coding all the durations in these themes. It took a couple of months, but we, you know, put them in. We put them in the equations, hit the button on the computer, held our breath, and just to remind you, this is what the speech data looked like, and this is what we found for the music data. One of those wonderful moments in science when it actually works. Um, and English music ended up being uh, significantly more contrastive or swing-like than French music in this measure. This is, again, purely instrumental music. So it was different from French music in the same way that the language was. Less of a difference, but in the, in the, in the direction of the language. So it was a case of um, musical rhythm reflecting speech rhythm. Now, this raises a whole bunch of questions, and some of which I will address now. Um, oh, by the way, I should tell you, as soon as I finished this study, I told a colleague about it. I was very excited. And he said, well, you know, I have an electronic version of the Dictionary of Musical Themes. <laughs> And uh, in 15 minutes, he proceeded to replicate in like 10 times my sample size. And luckily, he was nice enough to wait till I published my stuff till he published his stuff. So um, it holds up with much larger sample sizes. OK, so how do speech patterns enter music, if, if this is true, this idea that that these rhythms are reflecting speech? Well, there's actually a traditional view about this among musicologists. It's what I call the reverse Robin Hood theory. It's that composers steal from the poor and give to the rich. They're taking folk songs and they're putting them into their nice art music compositions. Um, and that's folk songs bear the imprint of the language because they're often written with the words of the language and that's how these speech rhythms get into music. But not of all our composers were, were folky, folksy composers, not that influenced by folk songs. And Del Debussy and Elgar are examples of ones that aren't that way. So our theory is more of a cognitive theory. We think it has to do with um, implicit learning of the rhythms of your native language. Now that's something that we all do. When you learn your language as a child, you don't just learn the sounds and the words and the syntax, you learn the, the correct rhythms with which to speak it. And we're very good at identifying non-native speakers partly based on their rhythm. And this learning begins in infancy. We know infants are actually sensitive to the rhythm of their language and can discriminate it from the rhythms of other languages even before they can speak. So we think, that, like all other people in a culture, composers have the rhythm of their language in their ears, and at particular historical times, they can draw on that, either implicitly or explicitly, in composing their music. And it's important to note that this is not a prescriptive theory. We're not saying composers are forced to compose with their native speech rhythms. It's, if the times are right historically, that that's something that can come out as a resource that they can use. OK, so that, I believe, is the end of the rhythm part. So, oh no, actually there's one other thing. How, what are some directions you could take this work? Well, one um, direction I think would be a lot of fun to take it is jazz. Uh, now jazz is a little harder to study because you don't have necessarily notation. Uh, a lot of it is improvised. So you'd have to actually study real performances and measure durations from recordings, which is a lot more work, something that we're actually doing now with the classical music. Um, but there's a lot of intuitions in jazz. So Paul Berliner wrote a book called Thinking in Jazz, and he talks a lot about jazz as uh, improvisation as kind of storytelling. And a lot of jazz musicians talk about um, analogies with speaking when they're improvising. So is a jazz musician's speech rhythm reflected in their improvis improvisations? I think that would be pretty interesting to look at. Did the way uh, uh, Louis Armstrong talk get reflected in his, his trumpet solos? Is something you could actually study empirically. And finally, broadening it to non-Western music. We, we started small, as you tend to do in science, to keep things manageable, but the techniques are very general, very applicable, and any time you have a language and a music that you can measure, you can apply these techniques. So I'd like to see this to apply to other uh, types of music. Okay, so what have we learned by looking at rhythm comparatively? Well, first, I think one nice thing is that we can really uh, say these guys were right. Uh, these, these musicologists uh, had very good ears. They were hearing things uh, that, that were subtle, uh, that were not obvious, but uh, we can now point to specific ways in which music reflects, music rhythm reflects speech rhythm, so we can take their intuitions and tie it to quantifiable scientific patterns. Um, and it suggests that as listeners, part of what we do when we listen to speech is we extract the pure rhythm of the signals. We, we, we hold on to that information independently of the words and the grammar and, and so forth, that we're hearing kind of music underneath the language as part of natural speech perception. 
Okay, so let me turn now to the second part of the talk, which is about grammar. So now we're going to move to a much more abstract level uh, and relationship between language and music. That was sort of about sound, that first part. This is more about structure. Uh, now, this has been a, uh, a locus of real debate. So as I mentioned, Leonard Bernstein gave a set of lectures at Harvard in the 70s, um, the, the Norton Lectures. And they were later uh, published as a book, The Unanswered Question. And actually, they're available to view on video. And they're just wonderful. I mean, he is uh, fantastically charismatic. He has amazing musical knowledge. And his uh, structural analyses and comparisons to language, unfortunately, didn't convince anybody. Um, but they were inspiring. And, um, and so a, a, a theorist and musicologist got together and wrote a book called A Generative Theory of Tonal Music a few years later, which was in some sense a response uh, to Bernstein, but uh, actually dealt with music in a kind of using the formalisms of, of language grammar. Um, and they, they took a totally different view. They said, okay, music has a structure, it has a kind of grammar, but don't be fooled into thinking it's anything like language grammar. It's actually very, very different. So there's been this back and forth, and it's continued right up to today. We have sophisticated mus uh, mu linguists arguing that there are deep relationships between the structure of music and language, and others saying, no, you're just fooling yourself. Um, well, languages and music do share some basic similarities as grammatical systems. They do have discrete elements, like we've talked about, the notes of a piano or of its musical scale, uh, chords uh, of a musical key, or words in language. And they have principles of combination. You, when these things are put into sequences, they're not just strung together randomly, they're, they're principles, and people are sensitive to those principles as listeners. And this results in sequences with, with a rich hierarchical structure, and that's important. Now, what do I mean by hierarchical structure? Well, take language to begin with. If you're a native speaker, or if, you're, if you know English, and I t if I say the sentence, the girl who kissed the boy opened the door, okay? There's a sequence of words in that sentence, the boy opened the door, right? But if you speak English and understand English, you know it's not the boy that opened the door, it's the girl that opened the door. In other words, you don't just interpret language in a left to right fashion, kind of interpreting words that are right next to other words as being structurally related. You know, so somehow implicitly, that words are combined into phrases, and phrases are combined into bigger phrases, and that's, you can get relationships like between girl and opened, even though those words are quite distant from each other in the sentence. And linguists draw what are called syntactic trees to illustrate that fact. So even though the word boy and the word opened are just smack next to each other in the sentence, they belong to different parts of the sentence structurally, okay? Um, so this is the hierarchical structure of language. Well, what about music? Well, musical syntax also has discrete elements, as we've talked about, such as tones or chords and principles of combination. And the one I'm going to focus on is called key structure. When you play in a musical key, you select 12 out of, uh, there, there are 12 possible notes in an octave in Western tonal music. You think about the, the notes between a C and another C on a piano. There are 12 white and black notes. You typically pick out seven of those to play on and emphasize. And, um, and we all have some implicit knowledge of that. So here's an example of a, just a little sequence of tones that conforms to a musical key. And here's a sequence that doesn't. OK, so what? Well, um, so what is that when tones conform to a musical key, they take on interesting functions, and they have kind of psychological qualities that they don't have outside of a key context. So let me illustrate. I'm going to play a little melody to you now. At the end of this melody, there'll be a note. And I want you to try and judge. Does that note sound um, stable, like a logical resting ending point for that melody, or does it sound unstable, like the melody should continue on? Okay. Okay, that sounds sort of closed, finished to most people. Yeah, all right. Now I'm going to kind of erase your memory of that. All right. And now I'm going to play another melody, and exactly the same task. At the end, tell me if that note sounds like a good resting point or it sounds unresolved and should go on. Yeah, that doesn't sound like it ended right. Now, now, let me play you the last note of the first sequence and the last note of the second sequence. They're both B, identical pitch. 
Um, but they make you feel very different. And that, uh, that's key. That's the magic of key. So in the first uh, melody, that was the tonic, the resting tone, the central tone of the, ton of the, the key. In the second melody, it was the leading tone, a very unstable tone that wants to resolve to, to the tonic. And this, this kind of tension and resolution business that these tones take on in a key is very much part of the experience of music. <clears throat> now, musical keys are, uh, aside from having these interesting relationships among tones within a key, they are also organized with respect to each other. So keys that share many pitch classes and chords are considered closely related in musical theory. And this relatedness can be portrayed with a, a diagram called the circle of fifths which these are now names of keys, so the key of C, the key of G, the key of D, and how closely or distantly they're related is, is the distance along the circle. So C and G are closely related keys, C and E are distantly related keys. And the perceived relatedness of keys drops off with distance. Now this is all very abstract, but actually as a listener, even if you've had not a single music theory lesson, you know a lot of this stuff implicitly. Let me illustrate. I'm gonna play a little chord progression, which um, I think you'll find sounds sort of prototypical. <laughs> Can we try that one more time down a little bit so not so buzzy? Okay, and now compare that to this one. Okay, something weird at the end of that one. Well, what was weird? What was weird? What was weird was I put an F chord at the end of a sequence that was in key of E. Okay, they're distant keys. Now that F chord, you play it by itself out of context. That's a lovely little chord. Nothing wrong with that chord. It's just, it sounded weird because that's not a, a chord you would go to at the end of a sequence in a key. So you have implicit knowledge of these relationships even though you may not have had any formal music theory. And this is true, this has been shown over and over again with ordinary non-musician listeners. Well, the significance of that, it's thought, is that having this kind of rich knowledge of keys actually leads you to per perceive musical sequences hierarchically. So if you, these patterns of tension and resolution, it's thought, are, are actually nested within each other, sort of like waves. And, and music theorists have diagrams for this that are sort of like the syntactic diagrams of language. And there's empirical data for this uh, that's been recently published. So when you, when you hear a little fragment, even something as simple as this little piece of a Bach chorale, whoops, can you bring that up? Okay. Okay, try one more time. You know, there's sort of an ebb and flow of tension and resolution. Uh, sort of in the middle, it gets more tense with that out-of-key chord, and it resolves at the end. But the idea is that your knowledge of key actually lets you hear d relationships between chords that aren't just right next to each other. Uh, um, so there's hierarchy, there's grammar. So are they similar, language and music syntax, or are they different? Well, these trees aren't exactly like linguistic structural trees, and, and, and so theoretical debate just goes on and on. I mean, there's just enough differences and enough similarities that people keep kind of plugging at this. So, but we can take an, a kind of a different approach. We can go ahead and look at the brain and see, well, what does it think? You know, what, what, what does the brain say about the relationship between grammar and music and language? Because we have some of the tools to be able to do that. And what's kind of interesting is that the brain data itself seems contradictory. So. We, we know, and this is, there's some lovely work, including work by my colleague Isabel Peretz in Montreal, that there are cases of brain damage that point to the independence of musical and language grammar. So you can have people that have brain damage and they report their music perception has changed seriously. Uh, they can no longer perceive out of key notes and chords. They don't hear music as having that quality of dissonance and consonance and tension and resolution. And yet they have no language problems. They're not aphasic. The aphasia, aphasia is language after brain language problems after brain damage. And this does seem to indicate that these are different beasts. You know, they're just not related in the brain. On the other hand, there's another technique where you actually look at what's happening in healthy normal brains as they process music or language in, in real time using brain scanners. Uh, and I've done some of that work. Other colleagues have done some of that work. And, and there's, when you look at the brain that way, there's a surprising degree of overlap in the brain areas and brain signals you get when people are processing the structure of music and the structure of language, including activation in an area that's n well known among language researchers called Broca's area, a region in the inferior frontal left convolutions of the brain that's long been known to be important for language and thought to be involved in processing the grammar of language. And this is a slide from a review by my colleague Stefan Kolsch, who's done a lot of really lovely work on the grammar of music and how it's processed, showing this uh, Broca's area on its left side and its right right side homologue being activated 
across a number of studies to the grammar of music. So this is kind of a brain, you think you can't go to the brain to look for the answer and the brain tells you two totally different things. So what do you do with that information? Well, you need some kind of framework to kind of reconcile those things. And that's what I've been working on uh, in some recent work. And the framework I've been proposing is something called resource sharing. And the idea of resource sharing is that language and music involve distinct mental elements. So your knowledge of words and, and their syntactic features, what's a noun, what's a verb, what goes together, what doesn't, that's really language specific. There are no musical analogs of that. Bernstein tried to make musical an analogies to nouns and verbs, and it just didn't work. Um, similarly, your knowledge of musical chords and keys and how those are related is just musical knowledge. It's not linguistic knowledge. It doesn't map onto your knowledge of syntax and language. So they're different kind of ingredients. They're stored differently in the brain. But when you process a sequence, whether it's linguistic or musical, you have to mentally connect elements into a hierarchical structure. And the hypothesis is that this integration this putting together, this kind of building the links between the elements to build the structures draws on some common neural resources. So in kind of a cartoon form, the picture is you've got some uh, networks in your brain, L stands for language, M stands for music, that kind of house these elements or representations. And you've got, those are separate, independent, they can be damaged independently. And you've got some other networks in the brain that have the kind of the neural resources to activate those representations during actual processing. And their connections, of course. And how this maps onto the brain is something we're just working out now. So one hypothesis is that the, these kind of more storage regions are in the back of the brain where auditory information enters, and these uh, resource networks are in the front areas of the brain. But that's something we're working on. What I want to focus on tonight is kind of how do you test such an idea? How would you ever take this into the lab and, and see if it works? Well, we're testing a, a prediction of this. If there are shared resources for processing music and processing language, then you'd predict that, and these resources are limited, you predict that musical syntactic processing should interfere with linguistic syntactic processing because they're competing for shared resources. This is kind of, and you, to test that, you have to present language and music together. Now, th this is sort of the walk, can you walk and chew gum at the same time experiment? You know, yes, you can walk and chew gum because those are probably aren't drawing on very different parts. Those are probably using very different parts of your nervous system. Can you drive a car and dial a cell phone at the same time? That's a heck of a lot harder, and maybe that's because they overlap in what they demand of the brain. So how do we... Um, test this. Well, it's actually already been tested in several studies, and I'll just be, just be focusing on the last one because it's the newest one. Okay, now, so we're going to use a technique that linguists have developed to measure language processing difficulty, and we're going to compare uh, grammatically and simple, simple and complex sentences using that technique in terms of how hard they are to process. Now, here's the technique. It's called self-paced reading. So you have a, uh, a participant sitting at a computer, and they're reading sentences, but instead of just reading whole printed sentences, they look at little bits of the sentence, and they're in charge of the timing. So as they push each button, like this, they see a little bit more of the sentence. Okay, like this, the scientists confirm the hypothesis. And what you do is you measure how long they spend looking at each little fragment as a measure of how difficult that fragment was to process, okay? Now, if, you know, people have no problem with this, they, they do it happily, and in a sentence like this, if you introduce the word was, here, and we don't color it yellow for the subjects, I'm just doing that for your, uh, make it easy. Um, people have a little bit of difficulty processing that word was, why? Because they tend to, conf to, to interpret the hypothesis as the direct object of confirmed. The scientist confirmed the hypothesis and then went and had a beer, as opposed to the scientist confirmed the hypothesis was false. That, that, that means the scientist confirmed the hypothesis was false, that's a whole clause. So there's a little bit of syntactic integration difficulty there. That integration difficulty completely disappears if you just add one word to the sentence. If you say confirm that instead of confirmed, okay? The scientists confirmed that, the hypothesis. Now they have no problem because they're expecting a clause to continue was false, okay? So this is what's called a garden path sentence. It kind of leads you down the garden path to thinking that this is the end of the clause, but actually the next word makes you revise syntactically your hypothesis. Of course, this is all implicit. You're not sitting there saying, I need to revise my syntactic hypothesis. Um, and, but it, it, there's a processing cost, okay? So this has been done and, done and done and done in psycholinguistics. Nothing new here, okay? What we did that was different was we added music. So now, so we used slightly longer sentences. Uh, so here's the scientist wearing thick glasses confirmed or confirmed that. The hypothesis was being studied in his lab. And what we did was add music and we added uh, a chord sequence. So that now every time you press a button, you don't only see 
a little sentence fragment, you hear a chord over headphones. And those chords form a well-formed Bach-style chord progression. And somewhere in that chord progression, we introduce an out-of-key chord. In fact, right at this critical moment where you go, okay? So we're making life hard for you twice, right? Once syntactically in language and simultaneously either giving you an in-key, easy syntactic chord or an out-of-key, difficult syntactic chord to process. And, and if they're competing for the same resources, we should find that having an out-of-key chord at this critical moment really slows you down and makes you take longer to process that word. That's the prediction. Now, this is a fun task, actually. And the subjects wear these headphones. They're told there's going to be some chords, but they're not relevant. You can ignore them. Just focus on the language, OK? Because we're counting on the brain processing the music automatically, as it tends to do. Um, and when, so let me give you a, a feeling for what it's like to be in this study. Now, I'm going to play. There will be sounds for the next several slides as I paste. I'm going to page through some slides. So let's try this. OK, this will be the example where it's an in-key chord. Oh, that's just a technicality. The out-of-key chords come from distant keys on the circle of fifths. OK, here we go. OK, can you turn it up? Okay. OK, so that's what it's like to be a subject. Now let's hear it with an out-of-key chord on the key word. And we can bring up the level a little bit more. So again, the subjects aren't told to do anything with that information. It's just there in the background. Um, and we measure the reading time to all these little bits of the sentence. So let me show you what we found. OK, so I'm going to show you the results now. So this is a graph of how long they spent looking at the, the, the words. And what I want to focus on is this critical word was, although there'll be data for other words. And what I'm going to plot is the difference between how long they spent looking at the word when it was difficult when there was no that in the sentence versus when it was easy, when you put the that in. So it's anything above zero means they spent longer time looking at that word in the more difficult sentence. So this is what we found. OK, here's the critical data. When everything was in key, that's the blue line, they slowed down. They looked, spent longer time looking at the word was when it was in the syntactically hard sentence. But if you had a simultaneously out of key chord, that's the red line, you really took a big hit. You, you slowed down a lot more, spent more time processing that word. Okay, the language processing was slower. So we got the prediction, the predicted interaction. However, there's a bunch of questions about this. Maybe it's, you know, this is nothing about language syntax. It's just you put an out-of-key chord and you slow people down. You know, it kind of distracts them. So we tried a couple controls for that. One is we tried uh, to put in, we first did sentences where the, the, the critical word was not structurally unexpected, but semantically unexpected. So now we're changing the meaning, but not the structure of the sentence. So here is an example. The boss warned the mailman to watch for angry dogs is a nice expected word. Pigs is not a very expected word. And so that would be our experimental word here when delivering the mail. And again, in key or out of key chord. And what happens there? Do people uh, slow down when they get that weird word? And do they slow down even more when they get a weird chord? Well, here's the data. They slow down when they get the weird word but there's no statistical difference whether, you not, whether or not you give them an out-of-key chord. Having that out-of-key chord doesn't slow them down anymore. OK, but we haven't, that's nice. So we're showing it's maybe something to do with language grammar, not language meaning. But we haven't really nailed down this distraction thing. Maybe out-of-key chords are just distracting, and somehow that messes up grammar processing more than semantic processing. So to do that, to test that, we did a whole second experiment. We redid our whole experiment, basically. But now, instead of changing from an in-key to an out-of-key chord, we went from a piano chord to an organ chord, OK? So you're going along happily with piano chords, and suddenly you hear this pipe organ on this one chord. And then it goes back to piano chords. And that's quite salient, as you'll see. Um, and the question is, do they, does that also have this interactive effect with the language grammar processing? So let's play this. So I'm going to bring up the volume. OK. <laughs> It's pretty salient. I mean, it's really great over headphones. It's as God suddenly speaks to you on this, <laughs> on this word, was. Um, and, but here's what happens, OK? Absolutely, you know, you slow down when you get to was, but having that bizarre, unexpected acoustic event doesn't slow you down any more than, um, than you would otherwise. So it's, it's really not just distraction, we think. It's really the length. Oh. Just a yes. 
Oh, no, I apologize. That's confusing, isn't it? No, they either see confirmed or confirmed that. And it, no, no. So the point is that uh, it's when it's when it's just confirmed, that's when that you get difficulty on was, but when you have confirmed that, you don't get the difficulty. And what I'm plotting is the is the difference, how long, you, how much longer you spend looking at it when you only have confirmed and not confirmed that. Clear? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, uh, and again, we repeated the experiment with the, the semantic manipulation. So using the dogs pigs experiment, and again, people slow down at the weird word, but the out of timbre chord doesn't make them slow down disproportionately more. Okay, so let me just summarize, that's a lot of information, so let me just summarize. It seems like musical harmonic processing does interfere with linguistic syntactic processing, and these are not things, that's not an obvious thing, um, that those things would interact in the brain. Unlike, you know, dialing your phone and trying to drive your car, where it seems kind of obvious that's not a good idea. Uh, it, but this musical harmonic processing doesn't interfere with semantic processing of language, and it doesn't, uh, it's not just due to the distraction of attention, that's what that timbre experiment showed. And so that we think this supports kind of a view of the shared processing of linguistic and musical syntax uh, in a novel sort of way. So now what have we learned by comparing syntax in language and music? Well, it does seem that perhaps the processing of syntax and grammar in music and language has a hidden connection. That the elements, the ingredients may be unique, but certain processes for putting those ingredients together may be shared. And that's actually worth knowing because it naturally leads to a new perspective on certain kinds of language disorders. So there are language disorders, including aphasia, where people have brain damage and they have problems processing the grammar of utterances, understanding the structure or producing the structure of sentences. And we've been doing some work with aphasic patients with these problems to see if they might have some musical structural problems as well. And it looks like they do. And that leads you to think about what's really wrong at kind of a mechanistic level. It's not just a ling language specific kind of processing, it's a more abstract structural processing, which would probably inform the kind of therapies you might want to use to help with these sorts of patients. So that's kind of a direction that we're going in that way. Okay, so let me just say a few final remarks. Uh, just to go back to where we started, music and language are two of the things that really define us as humans, as a species. We find them everywhere we find humans. If some intrepid reporter were to call back from the jungles of Peru tomorrow and say, I found the last tribe of humans, the ones that's never been contacted before, I would bet the farm that they would have language and music as the two things you can be sure that they would have. Okay. But there's, these things are universal, and they're, they're human, um, but they're typically studied independently. We have people in language, linguistics departments doing the language, and the musicologists and the cognitive scientists and music departments doing the music. But I think um, that may not be such a good idea, that actually, if you want to get some deeper insights into how these things work, it's comparing them to each other is a good idea because it's difficult to get insights to language by comparing it to anything else in the world because no other animal has anything like human language. It's difficult to understand music by comparing it to other animal systems because no other animal has what we would call music, at least in the, the human sense of the complexity of human music. But we have both of them, and they have just enough in common that we can look at them together and get deeper insights into both domains than we can get by studying either domain alone. So comparative work deepens our understanding of both. And that's really the theme of my book, Music, Language, and the Brain, that uh, came out earlier this year. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I, before questions, which I'm very happy to take, I just want to mention uh, one thing. If you, if you find yourself getting interested in music cognition, uh, let me do a couple things. First, let me invite you um, to the Society for Music Perception and Cognition meeting next summer in Indianapolis, Indiana, and there's uh, more information at musicperception.org. And um, also point you to a new textbook, uh, the first up-to-date undergraduate textbook for music cognition in oh, 20 years. It just came out from Oxford University, Oxford University Press called Music Thought and Feeling by a colleague and friend of mine. It's very good, and I, I can recommend it as a way to get into this field if uh, at a kind of introductory level. So anyway, with that, I'll be happy to take some questions. Yes? Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Uh, I'm thinking of history, sorry. Yes. Can you hear me? I'm thinking of the history of Western music, and if you think about the music of, of Bach and Vivaldi, you think of them first as being Baroque composers rather than German composer yes. or Italian composer. Yes. Is the influence of language present in the music, or did at some stage 
something happened in the rules of music which freed themselves so that the influence yeah. of language became apparent? That's a very, very good question. And I actually, we have done a little work on that because we were intrigued by German music. It actually, German language is a stress time language, so it has a high PVI, a high contrastiveness score. But the music, we found, has a surprisingly low contrastiveness score when we looked at it just as kind of an average. And then we said, well, maybe we should look at this historically. And so we, we actually have a, um, a study where we looked at the PBI of composers starting with Bach and ending with Wagner, basically. And we found a huge trend for PBI to increase over historical time. So in Bach's time in the Baroque era, it was very low contrastiveness. Maybe perhaps the influence of Italian music was so important back then. And then as you get into the classical and romantic era, it becomes more and more kind of contrastive and reflective of the language. And that's kind of interesting that, you know, that's, you could spin stories around that about finding yeah, the true German identity or whatever in music, but uh, it, uh, I should just point out that also Wagner is a huge outlier. He's the king of German NPVI in terms of his, <laughs> his music. It's amazing. It's out way out there on the graph. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so have you looked at uh, compared students who study and listen to music and the different kinds of music they listen to and their grade point averages? <laughs> No, I haven't done that. There's uh, interest in music and intelligence, but I haven't worked on that. I'm sorry, you had one uh, first, so go ahead. Yeah. Yes, um, oh, actually, I'll get back to you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes, that's very interesting. Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, so there's this, this has been observed for a long time. That sometimes people who have certain types of strokes, they become very non fluent, but uh, if you ask them to sing a familiar song, they can get it out pretty fluently. And that's actually the basis for a, a therapy called melodic intonation therapy, where they, they try and get the patient to speak in a kind of heightened uh, musical way to get the word fluency working again. And I have a colleague in Boston, Gottfried Schlag, who's working on that and showing that it works in certain cases in improving fluency and perhaps because it's recruiting some uh, re regions of the brain that are involved in singing generally and somehow getting them to bootstrap some of the verbal production areas that are having trouble with fluency. It's really interesting work. Now, uh, yes. Sorry. Uh so when you were playing the two um, segments um, in different keys, ending with the B, yes. that sounded um, like it concluded or not on the tonic, yes. the thing that first popped into mind was a comparison with optical illusions, oh. where you have lines, you know, and if you have the arrows pointing in on top of a line versus out, oh, yeah. um, the same length of line looks longer to the perceiver. Oh, that's interesting. And to kind yeah. of late, since you mentioned Christoph Koch, I think he's done uh, a lot with visual yeah. um, analysis. And I'm wondering whether yeah. there is any <clears throat> correlation between oral perceptions and visual perceptions yeah. or fooling the eye and fooling the ear. Yeah. There's a, do you know the work of Diana Deutsch at UCSD? She has a, she's a music psychologist who has this wonderful CD of musical illusions that you ah. can buy. Um, I think it's called Musical Paradoxes or something like that, all about this sort of stuff. And she's very interested in those parallels. So I'd suggest you take a look at that. Yes. Um, <coughs> thank you. Your last point about the interference of language and about music. Interference, right. yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we often have this experience of listening to music while trying to read. Ah, uh, yes. OK. Now, in the reading, uh, there's also uh, the difference between maybe a pattern recognition mm -hmm. and deriving meaning from just looking at it yes. rather than silent reading. Right. So your experiment should be able to uh, say something about that, right? Well, it's interesting. I mean, so the somebody, a colleague actually has studied, okay, let me back up. Some people find music helpful when they study, other people find it distracting. And um, a colleague has been studying that and trying to figure out what, what kind of in psychological variables that correlates with. But that is more of a kind of a global effect of music on your attention, I think. Whereas what we were trying to look at was very point-like, specific kind of zaps you know, from music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Oh, if you're reading actively speaking the words as opposed to just silent reading. Yeah. But well, they were reading. That was a reading experiment. Uh, maybe I'm missing your point. I'm sorry. Ask me after. Yes. Thank you. As a musicologist without access to experimental uh, capabilities, uh, a couple of things that have occurred to me uh, that might offer some, some uh, areas of, uh, of interest. Uh, you spoke about jazz briefly, yes. and uh, being f a fluent speaker of both English and American, um, <laughs> I have 
found that there is, in fact, a, uh, because the harmonic structures are very similar in many cases yeah. to the common practice period, yeah. the differences are purely rhythmic and huh. seem to correspond, correspond to some degree between the difference between the way that English and American are, are actually spoken. That's interesting. Which follows through yeah. on dis determining um, how non-English speakers do at interpreting jazz, whether their mm. acquisition of English uh, yeah. aids in that. influences the way they play music. Uh, uh, particularly as there is a whole yeah. school of European jazz performance. The other thing uh, along those lines, when I was teaching in India, um, Bombay University, there's considerable interest between the, the, the contrast between Hindustani and Carnatic music mm. and its mm. relationship with the oh. different languages yeah. involved there, which yeah. is very, uh, very uh, dramatic. That's a good idea. I should study that. Yes. <laughs> Does does what apply to Chinese? The oh the the the, uh, the music reflecting the language. Uh, nobody knows. I mean, the Chinese has a rich instrumental musical tradition, and so it would be great to compare that, say, to Thai music, because Thai Thai and Chinese have very different linguistic PBI values. So you could look at um, at the values uh, at the uh, music in that way. But uh, sorry, did you have a question? Yes. Yes, you have an NPBI chart that where you put the. You have an NPVI chart where you put the music and the language together, but right. the but the um, the music was closer than the language. Right. The difference now, what, between what is it? You did not explain mm -hmm. what your what what the why the the mu why the music was closer than the language. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of variability between composers. I mean, composers are all individual artists. They each have a distinctive way of composing, and they don't all line up within a culture. So that average plot just shows you the average across all the composers. If you go look at the original paper, you'll see a lot of variation among the composers. Some of them are closer to the actual language value, and some are further away. But yet they're still bordered in the same way. Um, in other words, the, the I'd have to go back and look. Language is still the outlier, and the music I is still within it. I think that might be true. But of course, you know, when you compose music, you've got all sorts of other things to think about besides your native language, all the meter, metrical structure, and all the other stuff. So you know, it's an influence. It's not that it's just a kind of Total reflection, yeah. And somebody from this side, yes. Um, yes, I was wondering uh, if you looked at non-native speakers. So if you had a native French speaker speaking English, okay, would he speak English with an MPVI closer to that of French? Yes, he does. That's been done. That's okay. actually that's a great question. But yeah, that's it's turning out to be a useful way to quantify uh, accent mm -hmm. using that measure. Right behind you. Can I go back to your? My husband is in the dementia Alzheimer's ward, okay. and I have watched for a year and a half this incredible thing where they, everybody can sing all the songs from the Little Yellow Song book from 50 years ago. Wow. As long as the music plays. They okay. have all the words, even yeah. if they can't make a sentence themselves. Okay. The minute the music stops and mm. the person says, what have we sung, oh. they don't know, yeah. unless she hums a little bit, hmm. and then they can say the words again. Okay. What, what in your system I figure that words must be hooked on to music very early. I mean, that very, in in songs, yes, in songs, words and music are very tightly integrated in the brain. That's true. And that my children will have to be listening to the Beatles. <laughs> That's not, not a bad thing, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you should, have you seen Oliver Sacks' book, Musicophilia? Yeah, it's really wonderful about music and Alzheimer's. Uh, yes? I had had a son who had an Alzheimer's who had a brain tumor and was operated and mm -hmm. was amnesic for a long time. And he had problems remembering what he read. Mm -hmm. But he had no problems remembering songs. Hmm. All the songs, all, he, all the songs uh -huh. he had heard, yeah. the Beatles, the country, the whatever, yeah. he knew all the words. Yeah. If you ask him, Today, what he had read yesterday, mm. he couldn't have told you. Interesting. So Interesting. there are a lot of people who are stressing the fact that for disabled person mm -hmm. to learn, if you can take the learning material and make it rhythmic, rhythmic or musical, it yeah. would help them yeah. retain <coughs> the word. Yeah, I don't think it's an accident that all the ancient epics and ballads are all sung. The, the Gita, the, the Odyssey, these are all chanted and sung. I mean, now that's. I to ask yeah. you another question. I read a lot and I listen to music a lot. But if I'm involved, and I do, I have music in my house practically all the time. But if I'm very involved in what I'm reading, I don't hear the music anymore. And if I want to listen to Mahler, which is my favorite 
composer, I cannot read. Yeah. So I guess that what you were talking, that there are regions that share, yeah. must also reflect in the way you react and you get involved in right. music or speech, even if it's only reading. Yeah, I mean, we ha we're, we're looking at this kind of laboratory circumstances where I think in real life you can get very absorbed in one or the other. Uh-oh. have got time for one more. I've got time for one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, some years ago there was a lot of interest in use, um, music enhancing language learning. Oh, yeah. Stuff like Lozanoff and stuff. It seems that some of the stuff you were talking about, interference, would actually prevent that from working. And he used Baroque music oh. with, in specifically, and he had a specific thing about the number of beats per minute you needed in order to enhance your ability to remember words in another really? language. Huh. And you know, this was all in this like, very new agey type yeah. stuff, so how scientific it was is okay. questionable. Yeah. You I hadn't actually heard of that work. I do know there's actually some very good work showing that musical training influences the ability to pick up the sounds of a foreign language, not necessarily the, the vocabulary, but if you've got a good musical ear, there's actually neuroscience research showing that that actually seems to sharpen your brain stems encoding of speech sounds uh, in foreign languages. So uh, musical training does seem to spill over to that aspect. I guess that's it. Thank you. Great. Yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.